So, welcome to DustyPete.com, because this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of God and the interconnection of His creation, where belief understandings, they may be challenged, divine misunderstandings, they may exist in traditional teachings, they just might falter as we pursue connection, context, and community with God and each other here in an environment of grace and love. So, feel free to journey around the space. Explore. We have many different topics for discussion. Outside the class, Sons of the Father, The Bible Project, Aleph Beta, Follow the Red String, and more. So lend your ear, then lend your voice. Join a conversation, start a conversation, ask questions. Because on this journey, you're probably around folks that just might be pondering the same thing. Community that can build and connect. So come in and join us. And welcome to The Dusty Feed. Of course, good evening. It's May 23rd, 2023, and we're continuing on our Matthew series with Tim Mackey with episode 34, The Passover. This is part one of three. For this way of doing things, you can watch the video before we begin chatting. So we hope to keep these to around 15 minutes or so. For you to catch and even easier to catch up on. So welcome to outside the class. In the description below are links to all of the audio, video, and source documents that we use here in the Dusty Feed. We want to make sure that any material we use here is properly credited to those folks who work so hard to bring it to us. Without their efforts, the learning we do here does not happen. And remember on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon if you want a reminder. And again, it is expected that you watch the reference videos first so you get a context for this discussion and to hear the perspective of the originator, in this case, Tim Mackey. On the dustyvid.com, on the outside the class section, we have the entire Matthew series thus far. Each of the source videos for all of our discussions are posted there in advance. So, if you have not yet, just pause this. Go to the dustyvid.com, explore, watch the video, and when you come back, then we can chat. And we're back. Okay, so I want to make it kind of clear as we begin that I'll probably be mentioning and discussing some points that'll be very challenging for some. And again, I suspect that a little divide the room at times. But my intent is to share what I currently believe and understand about the kingdom of God, its concepts, both the narrow and the wide. So Passover, the Passover, right? It's interesting that Tim starts off by talking about the uh, historic Christian calendar. Yeah? Um, it's interesting because that calendar has evolved since it was not even conceived until around 535 AD by Dionysius Exegus, right? Ironically, it was to calculate Easter's. Churches answer to Passover, and 
even then it was not widely adopted for hundreds of years, even after that. You know, but these Jewish feasts, seven of them, which uh, includes the Passover, they've been around for many, many, many millenniums. And, you know, for what it's worth, it was established by God to just those that follow him. So as you know, here on the dustofheat.com, we lean towards those uh, appointed times, the Moedim, the feasts of Yahovah, right? And in this story, we have a lot of what happens around this feast day as Jesus approaches and he enters Jerusalem. Matthew has been on this last long storyline journey from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem at the end of Jesus' time on earth. Things have been ramping up, both the rhetoric and the confrontation. But it's not to Rome, just to the abusive religious leadership of that day, right? He is addressing corruption from within the body. Yes, this is the body of Messiah that's talked about. And these members, they need to be called out. You know, this is not about Rome, although they was expected by the folks all around there anyways, that the Messiah would be addressing and dealing with Rome. It's just not the case. This, that, really, is the challenge that the people have and they have to deal with. One might argue they might choose wrongly, yeah? But as Tim stated, the ball's rolling, and I'll put it forward that it's not the Christian calendar events that are rolling, but the approaching Feast of Passover and its surrounding activities. You know, um, we're going to be introduced to a number of the in-the-day practices, of which very much affect those events as they unfold, right? Because we've just had the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The people are now ready for their king to swoop in, clean out Rome, and, and just take over. You know, ironically, that tends to be the view we have today for the Messiah to come, return, right? Sweep out Babylon and take over. You know, so honestly, we know the feelings that they're expecting. And let's be honest, we really can associate with them in a way. Um, we can see ourselves caught up in the triumphant entry and the expectation that things will now change. You know, weirdly still, it's, it's even with the royal treatment entry, right? It's the religious leadership of the day that take the most offense. You know, the reaction from Rome, actually, it's kind of slow to build and then different for them to deal with. You know, this whole thing at Eerily, it reminded me of a part of the story in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings Trilogy, and it's a prophecy of a coming king. The kingdom, Gondor, it has a, it's been under the authority of a steward of Gondor. That's a lineage of caretakers, and they've had them for a long time. The king is rumored to be returning, and the steward of Gondor, well, he just makes a proclamation. Gondor has no king. Gondor needs no king. Hmm. It's always intrigued me why uh, the leadership of the day were so, so resistant to the thought of the Messiah. Maybe it was because they just didn't see him coming. Maybe. They were not ready for the power shift. Maybe there was a semi-kept secret that the shepherds had visited the birth of the baby. Maybe it was not really understood of the visit from those wise men, the kingmakers, and, and then that brutal generational genocide of the children in that area from Herod. Maybe. 
they were not ready to believe that they'd missed it. You know, but to be fair, no one really grabbed it. Even with the rhetoric that John the Immerser, remember he's not Baptist, is not grasped, right? So when Jesus starts his teachings and his proclamations and the healings, that's when things start to unwrap, right? We're, we're all at the, the culmination of the unwrapping here in Jerusalem, the entry, the temple confrontation, inside cleaning, not outside cleaning. Jesus has been telling his followers that he will die. Three days later, he'll arise. And yet, it's not so black and white. We have a lot of parables and analogies that surround it. And then again, remember still that even his closest inner group, they didn't understand this yet. So let's chat a bit about Judas, okay? Um, you know, Judas sees that Jesus is, is in his mind, is not going to be the, the guy to take out Rome. So then in, in my mind's eye anyways, I think Judas is feeling a bit about what he's about to do. Feels a bit betrayed. As he's been with Jesus, he's seen what he's seen and he's heard what he's heard. But this was not the ending he was expecting. I, I love that Tim brought up the point about the religious leaders, for the most part, were probably very upright and moral folks, right? Not all were these conniving, villainous guys. They were just part of the fabric of their communities that they were in. So maybe in Judas's mind, he just sees this as heading in the wrong direction. And Jesus, he just needs to be stopped. So let's do this with the folks that already want him removed from the position. So here's a question. It'll be very hard to imagine, I guess maybe because uh, we're so aware of the outcome. But here it is. Do you think that Judas expected them to execute Jesus? That it would go to the point of killing him? Or did he think they would just arrest Jesus, deal with him, and then let the people know that he's not the Messiah of their expectations? Did he really expect him to die? More stuff to chew on. And then we get to the handover. How might that work? You know, it seems the, the best way to find is uh, an isolated time and a place, right? So the crowds would not get involved and just let them take them in. So Judas plans this, right, before we even get to the Passover meal. So there's another hmm moment. I wonder how they, the gospel writers, yeah, how they find out that secret of the, the when and where meeting with the Pharisees. Because I doubt he told them. Something to, hmm, we got stuff to think about. So, in part two, we're going to be talking about the history, tradition, and, and the practice of the Passover meal. Because I believe that the elements of that meal are very much what Jesus is talking about in that now infamous Last Supper. Right? So, next week, right? We're going to continue with this series, right? Episode 34, the Passover with episode, or part two of three. So our point to ponder, and uh, I want to go back to that clip and, and just remember in our minds, wrapping them up outside the class here, that um, may these words about our king with our time on earth never leave our lips. No, has no king. needs no king.